All right. I'll hand it over to Mark. So, but let's give this man a great round of applause. How are we? Oh, I talk very loud, so you might want to dim that a little bit. And I get a bit of excited. I can remember um, talking at Nawi. I've preached at um, large gatherings and also talked at some small ones. And the lady said to me, she says, I said, I, I apologise, I get a bit excited. And she says, she came up to me afterwards, she says, son, never, ever, ever apologise for being passionate about something. I want to tell you, never, ever, ever apologise for being passionately about Jesus. Never apologise about it. Never apologise. Um, just for some of these that... that um, I know a lot of people in the room. I've been in Sydney, East Illawarra, and the Greater West Division for a long time. Um, so I feel like it's a lot of family. The family's getting a bit younger, and I probably have more to do with you leaders. But um, it's great to be here. For some of you that don't know, I've got a little girl down the front that's been dancing crazy down there, Zoe. Say hi, Zoe. Yeah, she's going shy now. And I've got a little, little uh, girl, Emerson, a beautiful wife at the back there. But one thing that um, I'm passionate about is seeing young people come to know Jesus. And um, even just as simple as this, I don't know, it's something that God puts in people's hearts and puts in your heart about people passionate about coming to know Jesus. But you know what? I'm passionate about seeing when leaders take a stand, take responsibility and raise up to help other people come to know Jesus. And the cycle continues. I'm passionate about that. You know, today um, we, were, we were on the, on the way and I saw Joel Campbell. Where's Joel Campbell in the house? He's just there. Um, he was driving a bus full of young kids. I don't know, something in my soul just got me great excitement. I had this big smile on my face. Seeing young people take on responsibility, seeing, seeing young people stand up, going, you know what? I'm going to lead a youth group. I'm going to lead young people to come and be passionate about him. And you know what? There is a couple hundred young people that I believe will change the world. And there's a couple of big buts. And I want you to have a look at this video for me. Thanks. I got a, got a big butt. It's gigantic, if I'm going to be blunt about it. And you know what? The funny thing is, I got several big butts. And, and, and before, you, before you discard me or, or wince at the disgusting notion of that, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that possibly you have at least one big butt as well. Yeah, you like that? Hurts a little, huh? Let me tell you something. Let me just tell you something, okay? Everybody we know has a big butt. And more often than not, it's the thing that actually gets in the way of us living a consistent life for Jesus. Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna expound a little bit, okay? See if you can recognize some of these butts. But I have to work more. But my favorite TV show is on. But my kids have practice. But I gotta tweet something. But it's such a beautiful day. But I'm just not in the mood. But I deserve a break today. You see, everything kind of interferes with my life of, of just living an authentic life for God, okay? And more often than not, it always has something to do with some sort of butt, okay? Even the littlest of butt can distract me. It really can. The littlest butt can make me think, well, ah, I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to think about it today. I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Whatever God asks me to do, I seem to have a butt for it and get away, okay? And the most horrendously big butt of all time is the butt that gets in the way of me just hanging out with God and reading His Word. It's true. Think about it. All the times you're about to open that, and all of a sudden a big giant butt gets in the way. A butt, much like one of these. But I got a farm bill, but I'm tired, but the game's over, but I read last Tuesday, but I gotta check Facebook, but I don't like Leviticus, but it's too hot in here, but I, I just don't like books, but I don't understand it, but it's boring. But what does that have to do with me in the 21st century? Those are some ugly butts, people. Let's just call them what they are, ugly. Ugly butts. Okay, and there's a lot more to them, sad but true. Here's a list, although not exhaustive, of some of the most popular butts known to mankind. But I don't have enough money yet, but others will think that I'm a nerd if I carry the Bible, but they won't like me if I talk about Jesus, but I don't know if God will do what I ask, but I just can't get motivated, but I'm afraid, but I don't have all the answers, but the small group is the same night as Monday Night Football, but can I just let my life speak for itself? But I'm not happy, but that's not my gift, but that's the pastor's job, but I don't know how to pray, but I can't believe that, but I don't know where to start, but everybody else is having fun. Butts abound, friend, but, 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 here a but, there a but, everywhere a but, but. Okay? And, and, and the most overused butt of all time, but I just don't have enough time. Really? Oh, come on. We have a lot of butts. God has given us a real simple word. 
free. Okay? If we learn it and we share it and we teach it and we live by it, then see, God gets glorified, people benefit, and then we get blessed. That's why we do what we do. That's the why behind the butt. Okay? And ultimately, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here, my fellow butt lovers, is if your butt is bigger than your why, then your butt's too big. Okay, it's time to, metaphorically speaking, snap into a Slim Jim. Okay, let's slap on some spiritual shape-ups and hit the road a little bit so we can just manage the butts a little bit. That's all we're trying to do. That's what we're talking about. Let's minimize the excuses. Let's shrink the butts. Shrink the butts. Say it with me. Shrink the butts. That's what we need to do. And you and I can do that together. We can conquer this. You and I can do it. We start today, okay? I know we can. Let's just do it. No ifs, ands, or... Yeah. I think you get it. Okay, what do you think about that, eh? It's been interesting. Now, you can blame my dad for that. I got him in. I said, Dad, just check this. It's just not too over the top or, you know, I'm not going to get myself in trouble. And he goes, oh, it's, it's so funny, Mark. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, I think it'll be all right. <laughs> I got home and I showed my wife and um, Zoe was watching at the same time. You know what she says? I thought, but, but, but. And me and Lauren just started laughing. So interesting. But, but yeah, what is your but? What's the thing that stops you living out there for Jesus? What's the but, the thing that stops you? Well, I'm, I'm a Christian, and, and you know, I'm 80%, but there's some areas in my life that I just don't, it's, what's the but? What's the but? And then I'm just going to name a couple. Some people still got the giggles about the but, but yeah, that's right. I'm not good enough, but, but I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. It's an excuse. What's your butt? You know, I think some long-term Christians, I think their butt is, I'm just happy how I am. I'm happy to be lukewarm. But you know what? I can't be bothered. You know, I've been like this for a while. What's the difference? Do I have to go to church regularly? You know, it's okay this one time. Do I really have to tithe? Can't I tithe when I have more money? But, you know, it's okay. I'll, I'll let it, it will be okay. When I get more money, it's another but. It's another excuse. And often we come up with these shortcuts, excuses, and they stop God from doing a great work in us and through us. These buts, these excuses, these things stop God from doing a great work in you and through you. And I think often... We expect the blessings of God without truly following his commands in the word. You cannot expect the blessings of God if you will not follow what he asks of you. You cannot expect the blessings of God if you live 80% of the word. And you know what? I'm passionate. I'm sold out for this. You know, I was thinking about the first time I ever led anything in youth, um, I was at music camp in Greater West at Wellington. And I think my dad didn't know what to do with me because I was in Learner's Brass for four years, learning God is so good, and that didn't work. And I was in Learner's Guitar for the next four years, and God is so good, G minor, whatever. I don't know, but you know what? The crazy thing was, and then he, he put me as a leader, as he can do a sports elective. I think he was just getting out, I was 17, I can remember that. And since 17, I'm 33 this year now, 15, 16 years, I've been in a voluntary or a paid position, you know, pushing youth work, pushing about Jesus, try, trying to raise up leaders. And I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And there's a lot of people that are in the journey that are in on this. There's a lot of people. And I'll tell you this. We have a generation of world changers in here. We do. Who's heard this before? You know, the generation, you're going to change the world. There's going to be great things. Who's heard that message before? Just raise hands. You've had it instilled in you. You've had it spoken over you. You have had it down your throats. Pete, we believe in you. We believe in you. We just need you to believe in yourselves. You know, I've heard that this generation will change the world. This generation and lead us forward. This generation is passionate and willing to do whatever it takes. I believe that with the core of my being because if I didn't, I'd be wasting my time. Your leaders believe it. Our DCs on the back, they believe it. But I want to tell you reality. This is reality. And I'm an extreme optimist. I did a survey recently. I'm off the scale optimist. Can you believe that? Am I, yeah. 
But this is the reality. This is the actual reality. That in our Salvation Army, in our territory, we are in rapid decline with our youth, our children, and our young adults. That is reality. That is the reality. I want you to ponder with the question, why? I've pondered with it. I've cried over it. Why, why do you think we're in rapid decline? We've got to take a hard look at ourselves in particular when we do that. A um, little bit off topic, but who watched State of Origin? Yeah, go the Blues. Thank goodness. We got a Blues win on Facebook. It hasn't happened. Thank you. Praise, pray, praise God. He can do the miraculous. See, he can do the miraculous. Okay, here we go. Luke Lewis, man of the match. They interview him. Guess what a couple of key words that he says in his interview. He used the word consistency. I just thought tonight, boys, yeah, we just, we were consistent. The first, you know, we came out really hard in the first 20 minutes and yada, yada, yada. But he says consistency was one of his key words. We were just consistent tonight. That was our aim to be consistent. Laurie Daly, the captain, he says about consistent. Billy Slater, who's the loser on the other team, and the Queensland, he says, we just weren't consistent enough tonight. Who knows LeBron James? Yeah, LeBron James plays for Miami Heat. They reckon he's better than Jordan. I'm not so sure, but anyway. LeBron James, he's a dynamic basketballer. And you know what he speaks in an interview? You know what he talks about? He talks about consistency, crossing their T's, dotting their I's, doing the basics, doing the bare essentials to make sure the team wins. He emphasises on consistency. Roger Federer, who knows Roger Federer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Roger Federer, he may not be winning many majors at the moment, but he is the most consistent tennis player that has ever lived. He has reached more major semi-finals than ever before. And he uses the word consistency over and over again. What makes you so great? I'm just consistent. I want to perform week in, week out. Elite athletes understand that consistency is powerful. Consistency is powerful. And I think as Christians, I feel like God revealed to me as Christians, Mark, I think, and I'm including myself because I'm in Generation Y, just... Christians, young people, underestimate and undervalue the power of a consistent life following Jesus. We undervalue it. You know, I've been on the journey with a lot of guys, and I can remember um, this guy, I'd, I'd journeyed with him for a long time, and he left, it went a bit wild, he came back, he was sort of committed for a year, and after the end of the year, he goes, Matt, it's not happening, nothing's happening, it's not working. I'm like, God didn't call us to be a Christian for a year. He called us to love him and serve him for a lifetime. You know, Craig Groeschel says that young people, we overestimate what we can achieve in the short term. We overestimate what we can achieve in, in two years. But we underestimate what we can achieve in the long term. We underestimate what we can achieve through a life of, of, of giving our life to Jesus. And saying yes to him, not just once, but over and over and over and over again. I can tell you, the Sasha Army believes in you. Do you know that we spend more resources than probably ever before on children's and youth? The army wants to back you. The army wants to give you a go. And I can tell you, if you will stick at it, if you will persevere, if you will be consistent, I can tell you God's going to do the miraculous. When you partner a consistent life of loving and serving Jesus for the long term, you partner with that Holy Spirit, and that is a powerful combination, my friends. And I'm going to talk about a powerful combination in Scripture. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to Daniel 3, open up the Word. Daniel 3. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm cautious of time, and I want to just create space for God to move. So... I'll paint you the picture. Basically, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. He has basically put some idols together that saying that everyone must worship these idols, otherwise they'll be put to death. Okay? In a nutshell, that's sort of 
the situation they find themselves in. Anyway, so when the music starts or whatever, or the, um, they were supposed to bow down and worship. Anyway, they didn't. And they're called before the king. They are called before the king. And basically the consequence of this was death. They get thrown in a fire. And guess what happens? Here we go. We'll read it. So it's in Daniel 3, verse 13. Daniel 3, verse 13. In front of King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image, I made very good. But if you do not, you'll be thrown into the, the, bla- the blaze, the the furnace. They had a last chance. They were there before God. And what does God say? You shall bow down to no other gods than I. And, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, you know what? We could just do it this one time. We'll go back to Babylon and we'll just serve God. But we can still do that. But we can still serve God on the side. But they said, no, we will be consistent with what we believe and what we value and what is in the word. And you know what? And I sort of think this great confidence comes. And I think you young people have this great confidence. And I could see some of you young people saying this sort of stuff. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, reply to the king, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar. You like that one, Miffy? Yeah, that's right. Um, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They were willing to die to be consistent with what they believe. And I can tell you they were faithfully serving him before. Then they had an opportunity and they decided to be consistent. And God does something. God shows up. You can read through the description. He shows up. An angel appears in the furnace. And saves them. And I want to tell you, when you young people live consistently loving and serving him, applying your life to be, to equal that of what's in the word, God will do something miraculous in your life. Who wants God to do something miraculous in your life? You know, when I think about words of consistency, these are not great, great words. I think words of consistency like steady, even, regular, stable, constant, persistent, dependable. They're not flamboyant words. But when you put that to a faith and a belief in Jesus Christ, if you're going to be steady, if you're going to be even, if you're going to be regular, if you're going to be stable, you're going to, you're going to serve God no matter what. If you're going to be constant, if you're going to continually be persistent and push through, God will do something amazing in your life. And God is, and he wants to do something amazing in your life. Long-term consistency is the key to unlocking your God-given potential in serving Him. Long-term, consistently loving and serving Jesus is the key to locking your God-given potential. Not just in a day, just not in a year, but over a lifetime. I don't want to embarrass our DCs, but up the back there we've got Peter and Jan Laws. You just want to stand for a second? Well, I probably will embarrass you now, so just stand anyway. If you could stand, and then Gary and Judith Baker, you could stand. Just take a look at them. Some of you probably didn't even know them, or may not even notice them walking around. Um, these guys, um, I think, uh, um, Gary and Judith retire this year, and, and Gary's been to 50 youth councils. So you, you don't have to say, it. yeah, he's getting old, okay? But you know what? And Peter and Jan Laws, I think this is their second last year before retirement. I want to tell you this, these people, the thing I respect about them, is that there's a number of things. The thing I respect about them is they are constant. They have been consistent. They have been steady. They have persisted over the long haul. These guys have lovingly served Jesus, taken many hits along the way for many, many years, four times your age. They have done it and they have done it and they have done it and they have done it. Don't underestimate the power of a consistent life because their lives has impacted many lives 
and in turn they've impacted my life, who's impacted other people's lives, and the flow on continues. And I believe sometimes, I think our generation, me included, we need to make sure that we respect and honour those that have gone before us because they've laid a great platform, an example of what it takes for God to do something miraculous in your life. Now, I want to encourage you, and I want you to put your hands together, but before you put your hands together, I want you to thank God for people that lead by example. They're not following Jesus for a couple of years when it's good and glamorous. They're following Jesus for the long haul. And I want you to imagine this. Can you imagine every single young person in this room, when they turn 65, they are loving and serving the Lord now? Because I can tell you this, in 40 so years of time, there will be thousands and thousands of young people in here because of the consistent lives you have lived. And when you're consistent, God's Holy Spirit, when you partner with the Holy Spirit, He does the miraculous. I want to just give them a round of applause and thank you for their years of service. Come on, give it up to them. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories and then I'm just going to finish. Um, this week, um, Ali and Emily, um, they did the discipleship elective and they came over for dinner. And um, they're always good value, those two. A bit crazy, but they're good value. And um, when they left, Lauren turned to me. And she, Lauren's probably had a lot more to do with these girls than myself. But she turned to me and she goes, I'm really proud of those girls. You know what God's doing in their life. And um, I think we're proud of them because... They've been sewed into, but now they're starting to sew into other people. And, um, and as they were leaving, I was just saying, I said, you better do a good job. And they thought I was meeting of the elective, well, that as well. And they said, well, well yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll try and do a good job. Like, I said, no, you better do a good job of discipling those young women that you disciple at Menorah. Because those young women that you disciple will one day disciple women that will disciple my young Two little girls. And I want to tell you this. What legacy, what army, what kingdom are we going to leave the generations that are to come? I want to challenge you because you know what? You have the potential to change the world. But we've got to value a consistent life. Um, Ali used to... Um, one, this is, I'm just going to give you some opportunities. This is what Ali did. She volunteered one day a week at our church when she was studying. You need, any of you uni students thinking, oh, I've got this spare time? Imagine if you went up to your CEO or your youth pastor or whoever and said, you know, I've got one day I want to volunteer and um, can you help me? Well, I'd like to think that I would say yes and they could, you know, get you to do something. Anyway, so she came in and she'd give us one day a week and we'd get her doing all sorts of things. And, and one of the habits that she got into, she kept saying the word, I can't do this, I'm not good at that, I can't do this. And straight away, I was onto her and I said, you do not say that. Apparently, she said, if I, she keeps saying it, I'll punch her in the arm. But I, I don't know if I did say that. But that's a bit of an oh and issue, so don't do that. But, um, but either way, it worked um, because she stopped saying that. And if she was in the other room and she goes, I'm not good at this, I can't do that. I go, Ali? And she'd go, oh, man, he's everywhere. But anyway. <laughs> but the crazy thing is, is often we have a but, I'm not good at this, but I can't do this, but, oh, yeah, I don't mind, I'm going to if we cut out the butts, God can do something miraculous. And you know what? Ali stops using language like, but I can't do this, but I can't do that. And you know what? God, her confidence in Christ is just re- like, I think I'm inspired by the life that she's living because she's confident in who she is. I'll tell you, you've got to cut out these butts, these excuses. Because God just wants you, warts and all. You know, Emily um, came to me a couple of, um, couple of years ago and she says, Mark, um, I'm just not feeling this is sort of the right place for me. Um, I'm thinking I'm going to move on um, to another church, you know, um, and move on. And you know what? I was devastated. And I tell you this story because I reckon there's many in this room, there's many people that have already left the army. And there's many people in this people in the room that are a bit discouraged or frustrated at your core or whoever. And I tell you this, well, to encourage you to stick at it. And I said to Emily, I said, Emily, can you just hang in there? Can you just hang in there with me? Can you just persevere? I know it's not the most enjoyable time, and I had to take responsibility because she was unsatisfied in the area of the church that I was responsible for. I said, can you just hang in with me? God is doing something great. I just need you to hang in and persevere. I just need you to be consistent and constant and, and persevere. And praise Jesus she did. And she is part of much with a great other team of doing great things. You get 100 young people on a Friday night come and who are coming to know faith, and great things are happening. 
And there's a great team of people all through this room that do something in part of that. But you know what? If she didn't stick at it, she would have missed out. And I believe, I don't want you to miss out on what God's doing in the army and in through your life. But when you partner and you let the excuses go and you live a consistent life, the Holy Spirit rocks up and does something mightily and powerful. The last passage of scripture I'll look at and then I'll close is this. Guess what happens? In verse 28, Daniel 3, after all this happened, when they're consistently, the Holy Spirit rocks up, does something miraculous, then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the Lord. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. When we live a consistent life, God shows up, God gets honour and glory. Who wants their life to give God honour and glory? Do you want your life to give God honour and glory? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this is a crazy thing. I believe this. And it says it in the last bit in um, in Daniel uh, 30. It says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. What happens when you live a consistent life for a long period of time? Promotion follows. Promotion follows. I believe young people in here will be in great positions of influence over the Salvation Army in Australia and worldwide. I believe it. When you live a consistent life, in line with the Word of God, day in, day out, for the long haul, promotion follows, God's glorified, and God does something miraculous. I can tell you I get a bit excited about this, can't I? I'm just going to finish. What's the one area in your life, right now, if you could close your eyes, what is the one area in your life that you could be more consistent in your faith or in your walk? What is one area in your life where you could be more consistent in your walk with Christ? What are some of the excuses? What are some of the buts that are stopping you from reaching your God-given potential? You know, for some of us, it's laziness. For some of us, it's complacency. And I reckon there's a lot of long-term Christians or salvationists that have a spirit of complacency. And what, is, what do we say about what happens? He will spit the lukewarm out of his mouth. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is it? Just sit there in quiet. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you.